Welcome to the third lecture on process control. Uh, I'm Gustav Olsson from Lund University in Sweden. And uh, now I'll show you the pictures. And today I'll talk about control system parts. And this lecture is now part one of the lecture three. My co-authors are Penille Ingelsen from Hilleröd Utility in Denmark and Bengt Karlsson from uh, Uppsala University in Sweden. This lecture will, will be about sensors and instruments and control handles, the actuators, and also how to take care of all the data that is coming in from the sensors. This uh, description, <clears throat> sorry, this description of sensors and control handles are going to be described in this part number one and monitoring and supervision in part number two of the lecture. Now, looking at sensors, there has been a tremendous development in online sensors for wastewater treatment. And of course, this has a profound impact on the applicability of instrumentation, control, and automation. And we know that no operation can perform better than the quality of the measurement data. In other words, first of all, we have to really examine why a specific sensor is used, where to place it, and how to use it, but also to take care <clears throat> of the data, so, sorry. <clears throat> Excuse me. And uh, to take care of the data, to provide information from the data. The interesting and encouraging development is that instrumentation and no longer the bottleneck for the control of wastewater treatment. But of course, we also need to check the data quality. And this will be the topic of the part two of this lecture. <clears throat> There's a fundamental issue, how often to measure. In other words, the frequency of the measurements. Do you have to measure once a minute, once an hour, once a day? Well, this depends on the dynamics that we described in the previous lecture number two. Some sensors or automatic analyzers also are dynamic in the sense that they don't present the result immediately. You have to wait for the result and that has to be taken care of and considered also in the control decision. We have different kinds of measurement and it's not only online sensors, but also laboratory analysis and human observations. And all of this together provides the information necessary and desirable for making a good operation. Now, if you look at the instrumentation of wastewater treatment, there is a whole sequence of different kinds of measurements that we have to do. Physical variables like levels, flows, and pressure, they are used and monitored to keep the plant running. So they don't include anything about the process behavior. However, without them, we wouldn't be able to run the plan. Then we have to measure the primary properties of the wastewater, like suspended solids, pH, alkalinity, and conductivity. And these are physical chemical measurements, not bi uh, measuring biological activity in itself. Then dissolved oxygen is a crucial parameter in all biological wastewater treatment. Then organic content, both COD and TUC can be measured today online. And of course, now we also have online sensors or instruments available for ammonia, nitrate, phosphate. And all of this is a crucial ingredients in the control of bio P processes. Well, bacterial content is not easy to measure online, but of course we can include that kind of information 
from further analysis of the system. Also, respiration rate. As you recall from the last lecture, a respirometer works to actually uh, estimate the oxygen uptake rate or the respiration rate. And this in itself is an interesting signal to see the activity of the biology, of the biological uh, activity in the system. Well, uh, the measurements, they are made in a hostile environment. It's certainly not a laboratory environment. So that means we have to keep track of, of um, all the degradation that can take place because of this environment. Sometimes the quality is poor of the measurements. We might have systematic errors or bias. Some values are missing. There is noise available. Noise is also included both in the instrument in itself and also noise created in the process itself. For example, that the mixing is not complete and you see variations of a concentration both as a function of time and a function of space. And as we said before, the measurements are not uh, direct. They are delayed in some way or another. And some analysis are slow. It may take uh, both uh, half an hour and an hour and even more to get the result. And of course, some of the measurements are biochemical. They involve chemicals in the instrumentation. And some instruments are expensive. So we have to consider, is it worthwhile? What can you say? Part of this we discussed in the DO, dissolved oxygen control, using the ammonia sensor. The cost for the ammonia sensor, can it pay for the savings in energy, electrical energy, for example? Well, as an example, here is a luminescence dissolved oxygen sensor. And uh, the sensors today, ammonia or DO sensors, are quite advanced. And um, it also means that cleaning calibration uh, is not required several times a day, as it used to be in the early years. Now, these uh, sensors are considered reliable by the operators in general. And of course, there are conductivity sensors that give other kind of signals about the quality of uh, the process behavior. However, there is a hostile environment. And this means that the probes, of course, are certainly not clean as they are could be in the laboratory. They are affected by the environment. And of course, this has to be considered so that the probes are properly clean. In some probes, there is a certain amount of self-cleaning, but the operator and the instrumentation engineer really have to watch out for the hostile environment all the time. You can simply not leave the instruments for a long period of time and trust the data. Uh, as you can see from the picture, an ammonia sensor is an ion selective sensor and it contains interesting sensing elements in it and it is considered, well, an advanced sensor, but giving useful information. Or a turbidity probe can also provide important information about the suspended solids in various parts of the process. Or a COD or nitrate analyzer are built on UV spect uh, spectroscopic uh, analysis in order to find out the amount of these uh, uh, organic uh, pollutants. Now, some sensors are truly advanced and can give several uh, different uh, kinds of information. In this case, you can see, for example, eight different sensing elements. One is measuring the pH, the second one, the conductivity, the third one, the free chlorine, the turbidity, or the flow rate, turbidity are also measured. 
And this gives a significant amount of information to the system. But of course, as you can see, for example, on the turbidity signal, it's certainly not noise free. So this calls for further screening and analysis of the data before you can use it as information. You can look at the flow rate to the right here. The dip here, is it a real one or is it just an outlier? If you look at the turbidity here to the right, you can also see a peak and probably this should not be taken into consideration for a flow, uh, for a control decision. This is another example of how online sensors can provide interesting information. The green curve on top of the other two is the ammonia concentration in the inlet. And of course, this is varying from a day-to-day -day basis. This is a period of about 10 days. Now, looking at the nitrate, concentration, the red curve that below here. This is a nitrate concentration in the anoxic zone. And you can see here, for example, on the 30th of September, it's going down to zero. Look what happens at the phosphate. The phosphate is suddenly increasing here. A similar thing here happens a little bit later at the red line. The nitrate is going down to zero and the phosphate suddenly uh, pops up. This is a sign of phosphorus release that is made possible once the nitrate concentration has gone down to zero. So there are several interesting indications that can be observed from online measurements, in this case, in an anoxic reactor. Now let's turn to the actuators, the actuators that actually provide the change from a computer signal to power, to muscles, if you wish, from the brain to the muscles. And the actuators can be pumps, motors, valves, and so on. Looking at the plant design of a BioP uh, removal system, there are several uh, control actions, and we have talked about them before. The air supply, internal recirculation of nitrate, the return sludge flow rate, the sludge outtake, adding external carbon or adding chemicals. The point is that now looking at the actuators, we also have to consider what is the cost for different control actions. And some of the controls are relatively cheap. Looking to the left here, to change the waste sludge flow rate or to change the return sludge flow rate or step controlling the step feed into the aerator or changing recycle schemes. These are relatively cheap operations. And um, therefore, the cost for the control action in itself may not be considered as a serious um, uh, problem. On the other hand, other, co other uh, control actions are more expensive, like chemical additions. You pay for the chemicals. You pay for the external carbon. And also for the sludge conditioning and for aeration. In other words, looking at these control actions, you have to consider not only um, the cost for the instrumentation, but also you would like to make the signals as resource effective as possible. In other words, saving energy, saving resources in terms of chemicals. Looking at the actuators, many of them are non-linear. For example, pumps and valves. You remember in lecture two, we talked about dissolved oxygen control. And what is the reason for the airflow controller? Well, you don't have to know the characteristics of the valve. You simply measure the airflow. And based on the airflow, you open or close the valves so that you get the desired airflow. In other words, we don't have to know this. And this has to be compensated 
by measurement and control actions. Some of the actuators are one way. A chemical dosage can only be positive. It cannot be negative. And of course, often the response is not direct. Here we have to consider um, the timing of the control actions. Let me take one example of dissolved oxygen. If you increase the airflow, you wouldn't see the dissolved oxygen concentration increase significantly within half a minute or one minute. It may take 10, 15 minutes before you see a significant influence from the control action. In some case, I actually observed in a large treatment plant, they were measuring the dissolved oxygen several times a minute, but they also changed the airflow twice every minute. And of course, this created only problems instead of solutions. And by changing the sampling rate, the frequency of the airflow changes from half a minute to 10 minutes, we could save a lot of energy and we saved a lot of process problems. So this means that it's very important to know how quickly can the control action really influence the process behavior in itself. And of course, the system is limited in amplitude. You can not increase the flow rate of the air more than 100%. You cannot come to a negative flow rate and so on and so forth. So they are limited and that kind of limitation has to be taken into consideration. Looking at control valves, I said they are nonlinear, yes. Another feature that we have to consider is that there is a pressure drop. When you close the valve, minimize uh, the valve area, then there's a higher pressure drop. And this means that the valve, well, again, it can only be open to 100%, even if you wish to increase the flow rate of air or of a liquid. You cannot open the valve more than 100%. And sometimes, of course, we feel that kind of limitation. The sensitivity is different too. As a consequence of the nonlinearity, to increase <clears throat> the flow from 10 to 20% <clears throat> needs a different kind of valve movement than to increase, let's say, from 80 to 90% because the valve is not linear. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now, the flow rate through the valve, if there is a liquid, the flow rate is proportional to the pressure difference across the valve and the square root, uh, square root of it. If there is a gas flow, for example, the airflow, then the flow rate of air is proportional to the square root of P times the pressure drop. So that will determine the design of the valve. Let's look at some of the valve characteristics. Very seldom you have a linear valve. In other words, where the valve opening as a, uh, and the flow rate are linearly related. Most often we have either a square root valve where there's a lot of flow rate change in the beginning of the valve opening and relatively little at the end uh, when the valve is almost fully open. In some other cases, we have so-called equal percentage. And that means that the opening is less sensitive in the beginning and more sensitive when the valve is almost fully open. It's like a square a root behavior. That's typically what happens in your bathtub when you open the bottom valve of uh, the bathtub. So this can be described as the flow rate is proportional to the square root of the valve opening. That's a square root valve. And of course, an equal percentage has another kind of relationship between the valve opening X 
and the flow rate f of x. Um, now we can actually look at the valve behavior. And this is part of uh, the monitoring that we will talk about later on. Because this is an air valve. And you can see, of course, it's not ideal. The black dots are the relationship between the airflow and the valve opening. The red dots are taken at a later occasion. And you can see now that the airflow is different than the behavior with the black dots. In other words, you can see that we can detect something in the valve that is not normal. In other words, by measuring the airflow and the valve opening, we can detect the valve behavior in itself. In other words, this is monitoring of the equipment to make sure that it's operating properly. So factors to consider in the valves, sometimes we have pressure spikes. If you move the valve too quickly, then you create a pressure spike. And of course, over the valve, there's a pressure drop. And if you close the valve and keep the pressure, that means you lose energy, most often electrical energy. So that is not efficient from a resource point of view. So <clears throat> factors considered in aeration is, again, pressure, keeping a pressure high means you use a lot of electric energy. So we have a reason to minimize the pressure. And in the previous lecture, you saw, yes, there are ways to minimize the pressure. And the coupling to air valves is very important that you don't have to know the characteristics of the valve in order to have a good operation, provided that you measure the airflow. The pipe layout, layout is also important. If you have, for example, a 90 degree corner of a pipe, that creates a pressure drop and that creates another kind of friction in the system. So this will cost energy. So in other words, any bendings of a valve, uh, sorry, of a pipe should be very smooth around the corner. And also the diffuser membranes, well, of course, they have to be clean. Otherwise, the pressure drop over the membrane will also cause energy losses, uh, unnecessary if the membranes are not clean. In surface aeration, you have another kind of system where the efficiency is less than if you have membranes in the bottom of the aerator. Looking at the primary pumps, well, that's a very big part of the total power demand. You simply have to lift um, the water from the level in the sewer up to the treatment plant. So, of course, the pumps have to be efficient. It's difficult to reduce the power demand, but efficiency can be considered. For example, is it possible to change the desired water level? Again, all the time see what is the minimum level difference that I can create in the design of the system. And this water difference, level difference, should be considered not only for primary pumps, it should be considered, for example, for return sludge flow rate, for the recirculation of nitrate in all these situations, or for the backwash of filtered water. Again, all the time consider, is it possible to decrease the level differences? Because then you will save energy. The pump design. Well, when we describe the disturbances in a system, you may recall one flow rate change caused by on-off pumps. We had three primary pumps. And this caused the flow rate to be located at three different levels. That kind of step disturbance of the flow rate is causing operational problems. Sometimes the pumps are over-designed. 
in other words, you use only a little part of the pump capacity. And we have seen examples either where the compressors are far too over-designed. I one example where the plant had three compressors and using all three of them was never necessary. Even one compressor was over-designed because of a fault in the design process. So two compressors were used completely unnecessarily, creating a lot of energy waste and also creating a lot of problems, operational problems in the aerator. The design of the pumps has to be so that the efficiency of the pump, uh, pump is highest at the most common flow rates because the efficiency usually in the pump varies sometimes between 30 and 85% because of the flow rate. And there you have to make sure that where the pump, the flow rate is most common, that's where the pump efficiency should have its maximum. And the same thing with motor efficiency. Usually motors are more efficient than pumps. Looking at uh, flow rate control, then it's important to consider speed control of a pump. This curve is the relation between the flow rate and the pump speed. Uh, sorry, yeah, and the pump speed. So if you decrease the pump speed to 50% down here, then the flow rate is 50%. You can decrease the flow rate by uh, minimizing the area in the valves. Then you control by uh, decreasing the flow rate through the valve, and that will in turn increase the pressure. And that in turn will force the pump to work more. This is like having your car where you have the engine running full power all the time, and the only way to change the speed is by braking more or less. That's a lot of inefficient operation. On the other hand, if there is a variable speed, the pump efficiency is much higher if you have a, a, a speed control. The power necessary is varying with the cube of the flow rate. And that means with speed control, you go down to half the flow rate, for example, and you use only about 12% of the power. Now, this is the theoretical number. Actually, the pump efficiency, as well as the power electronics and motor efficiency are also changing, depend on the operational level. So the true number is higher than the 12%, but still is so much more favorable to control the flow rate with the speed control of the pump and not with the valve control, because then the engine in itself is changing when the demand is changing. So you have to consider both the pump and motor efficiency, having the maximum efficiency at the most common flow rates. And the energy cost is typically 90% of the lifetime cost. So consider very carefully designing the pump or choosing the right pump to have the most energy efficient operation. Also, the, there is a friction loss in a pipe. And actually, if the flow rate is increasing to the double value, then the relative friction loss is increasing four times. In other words, with this, uh, the friction loss is the square of the relative flow rate. In other words, if the flow rate uh, has to be uh, designed together with the pipe diameter, if there is a too narrow pipe, then there is a very high friction loss. So this has to be considered both for gases and for uh, 
for liquids. So as a summary, there are several online sensors available today. You have to consider that the environment is hostile, so you cannot just leave the instruments and believe that they will work all the time without carefully maintaining them, but still maintenance today is so much easier than maintenance yesterday. Sensor maintenance and calibration are critical, but you have to be sufficiently competent to have these advanced instruments. Variable speed control of pumps is a proven technology. And today, I would say it should be a must in all control systems in wastewater treatment system for both air pumps and for water pumps. And of course, communication today makes it possible to look at the plant not from one single control room, because the control room is everywhere. It can also be on the kitchen table at home with the operator over the night. The people don't have to be at the plant at non-working hours, but somebody has to have the responsibility if anything should go wrong. And the control room can very well be at the kitchen, kitchen table. And this, of course, is made possible by all the online instrumentation and the advanced communication available today. So with this, we will finish uh, this part of lecture three and uh, welcome back to part two of the lecture three later on. Bye-bye. Thank you.